how do wounds heal? What are the local factors that can either improve or impede wound healing? We've already talked about systemic factors in the last video. This is part two, local factors for wound healing. Let's do it. Welcome back to Citizen Surgeon. My name is Dr. Eric Pearson. I'm a pediatric surgeon, and I'm here to scale surgical education, get you comfortable on the wards, in the ICU, in the operating room, and of course, to help you crush your exams. We are talking about wound healing. This is going to be a five-part series talking about everything to do with wound healing. Now, a prerequisite to this is to watch that Healing 101 video. I'm gonna put a link to it above. And if you watch that, read the notes, you're gonna understand all the phases of wound healing, the cells involved in wound healing, and of course, all of the critical events. But today, we're jumping to the local factors. So, quick review, what were the systemic factors with wound healing? What inhibits a wound from healing? We talked about age, we talked about gender, we talked about different diseases like cardiovascular diseases and diabetes, we talked about obesity, we talked about nutrition, how does a protein deficiency affect wound healing, how about those different vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, talked about that. And then finally, smoking and alcohol. What do these have to do with impeding wound healing? I went through the mechanisms of this. We talked about how they can limit angiogenesis, limit collagen production in that proliferative phase, limit remodeling. So really important video. Definitely check that out. Systemic factors with wound healing. But today, local factors. So what are those local factors? I'm going to show you that right here. So there are four major local factors we're gonna be talking about. We're gonna be talking about how the oxygen content of the wound affects wound healing. We're gonna be talking about infection and inflammation with wound healing. We're gonna talk about foreign bodies. That is something really common that I deal with with wound healing as a surgeon. And then finally, we're gonna be talking about the different wound characteristics, whether it's a stellate wound or a simple laceration, whether it's a broad-based wound or you can't, and you can't get the edges together. We're gonna to be talking about those wound characteristics. But first, oxygenation. What does the oxygen content of the wound have to do with healing? So the oxygen content of the wound or oxygenation is critically important in all phases of wound healing. Now remember, oxygen is critical for cellular metabolism. Without it, we can't produce ATP and without ATP, we don't have any energy in the cell. So oxygen itself has a number of benefits. Number one, it decreases the risk of infection. It improves or increases angiogenesis in a wound. It increases collagen production. It improves fibroblast proliferation with that collagen lay down, okay? It improves re-epithelialization and wound contraction, okay? So all of these things are aided by oxygen. Now, initially when you have a wound, when you have an injury, there is some local hypoxia within the wound. It promotes and stimulates fibroblast proliferation with collagen lay down in that proliferative phase. It stimulates re-epithelialization. It promotes wound contraction. Then of course, it also acts as superoxide. We're gonna talk about what those reactive oxygen species, ROS, or superoxide has to do with wound healing and preventing infection. So initially in the wound, there is some local hypoxia. You have a wound injury, there's gonna be a loss of blood flow initially, you're gonna have that coagulation right before the inflammatory phase, okay? And that local hypoxia stimulates cytokine production and chemoattractants to get those cells within the wound, all right? However, if hypoxia is prolonged too much, we're going to see a reduction in the wound healing process by inhibition of these things I talked about. Inhibition of angiogenesis, inhibition of fibroblast proliferation and collagen laydown, inhibition of that re-epithelialization, and then a lack of superoxide. And superoxide, or these reactive oxygen species, are going to act to 
be bactericidal and limit infection in the wound. When we look at chronic wounds and their oxygen tension compared to healthy or acute wounds or even normal tissue, we're gonna see that the oxygen tension in a chronic wound is hypoxic. It's five to 20 millimeters mercury compared to control tissue at 30 to 50 millimeters mercury. So initially we need that hypoxia to stimulate the wound healing process, but then it has to go away and we need normoxic tissue and good blood flow so we can have all of these processes in the wound healing cycle. So another thing I wanna mention about these reactive oxygen species, there are two major ones, and that's hydrogen peroxide, or H2O2, and superoxide. Now, not only do these limit infection, they also stimulate almost all aspects of the wound healing process. So they stimulate and improve cell motility. They stimulate and improve angiogenesis, and they stimulate and improve cytokine action. Now we need these initially, but if reactive oxygen species continue, then that can actually lead to tissue damage. Now another thing to know about oxygen is we can use it as therapy. All of these beneficial effects can be used with hyperbaric oxygen therapy, or HBOT. And sometimes in chronic wounds, because they're hypoxic, we can put them in an oxygen-rich atmosphere at a higher pressure, and that's gonna improve wound healing. So infection or prolonged inflammation, this is another aspect or a local factor that can impair wound healing. Now, we are covered in bacteria, okay? The most common bacteria would be Staph aureus, also Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and beta hemolytic streptococci. They are covering our skin. And so when we get a laceration or we get a penetration of that protective skin barrier, these bacteria have access to that wound. Now, one of the things I want to make sure you understand is what's the difference between contamination versus colonization versus infection, okay? Well, what's contamination? Contamination is really gonna be any wound that penetrates that skin layer because you're gonna have bacteria within that wound. And so the definition of contamination is when you have non-replicating bacteria in a wound. Well, what is colonization? Colonization is when you have replicating microorganisms or replicating bacteria, possibly even fungi, within a wound, okay? But they're not causing tissue damage. So contamination, that's when you have non-replicating microorganisms, fungi, bacteria within a wound, and colonization is when those are replicating, but there is no tissue damage. So what is infection? So infection is replicating microorganisms within a wound that are causing host or tissue injury. So that's the definition of these three things that's really important to know when we're talking about local factors that can impair the wound healing process. Now, how about inflammation? So inflammation is a normal part of wound healing. In that initial inflammatory phase, we get IL-1, we get IL-6, we get IL-8, important in wound healing. We get TNF-alpha, and these cytokines that are involved in recruiting different cells like our neutrophils and our macrophages and then our fibroblasts into the wound for, those, for that healing. Now, if that inflammation continues, it can be an impairment to wound healing. So we get an increase in proteases or MMPs, matrix metalloproteases, and those can break down the extracellular matrix. Now, when we look at infection and inflammation as a combo, we can see that one of the major things that can lead to an impairment in wound healing is the formation of biofilms. So biofilms are complex communities of aggregated bacteria within a self-secreted polysaccharide matrix, okay? So it's like a slime full of bacteria in a wound that's gonna cause chronic infection and chronic inflammation. One of the things about mature biofilms is they are typically resistant to conventional antibiotic treatment because those bacteria are protected 
in this polysaccharide matrix, all right, the way I visualize it is this slime. And so you have to get rid of that biofilm in order for wound healing to occur. Now, one of the major bacteria that's found within biofilms of chronic wounds and inhibits their wound healing is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So Pseudomonas is a difficult, it's a very robust bacteria. It's found in biofilms and in chronic wounds, this is one of those that's gonna stop that from healing and needs to be eradicated for that wound healing process to occur. Now, the third thing is foreign body. So we talked about oxygen, we talked about infection inflammation. Third is foreign body. So whenever you have a wound that just won't heal, you gotta think about biofilms, pseudomonas and chronic healing, think about hypoxia, but also at top of your mind, especially as a surgeon, I gotta think about foreign bodies. So one of the things that happens is that children will go down a wooden slide and then they'll present with an infection. Now they'll get an x-ray, but the x-ray is not gonna show anything because they were down, going down a wood slide and wood is not a radio opaque. So many times I've seen that a retained splinter under the skin will lead to one of these infections that keeps coming back. So if you have an infection that keeps coming back, think about foreign body. Now, if there is a foreign body under the skin and that gets populated with bacteria, that wound is not gonna heal. So you gotta pull out. They're surgically excised that foreign body, be it wood or something else, before you're gonna get adequate wound healing. A lot of times in traumatic wounds that are full of dirt and gravel, we'll go to a great extent to wash out and debride that wound to get all of the foreign body out so that we can create a nice healthy bed for wound healing. Now when we look at wound characteristics, we're going to talk about several different things. So one is the mechanism of the wound. So. Did you have a wound that was a simple laceration that sharply divided the tissues? That's gonna heal better than a wound that has a crush injury. So if you have wound that is split or the skin is split following a crush injury with you at where you have extensive tissue damage around the wound, that's gonna be a more difficult wound to heal. Second is the location of the wound. So. When the wound is located in uh, areas like the bottom of the feet for diabetic pressure ulcers or in gaiters area around the medial malleolus where that's a hypoxic environment, those wounds are typically harder to heal and you have to really pay attention to the systemic wound factors, you know, and make sure you optimize those. Nutrition, obesity, alcohol, smoking, all of those things need to be optimized so you can get wounds that are in these difficult locations to heal. Third is time. So is this an acute wound? So is this something that happened within the first the last 24 hours? Or is this a subacute wound, 24 to 72 hours? Is that gonna have some now bacterial colonization or some necrotic tissue that might need to be debrided? Or is this more of a chronic wound over 72 hours or longer than that? And perhaps it has a biofilm or it has, um, colonization and infection. So those things are important to consider is the timing of the wound that you need to take in that history. Fourth is hydration of the wound. So typically moist environments heal better than dry environments. So is this a dry desiccated wound? And if so, we may need to use some sort of dressing to keep that wound bed hydrated. And we're gonna be talking about that in the fourth video on dressings. Fifth is dimension. So what are the dimensions of the wound? Is this a large open wound? Okay, is this a five by seven centimeter wound where the wound edges are not gonna come together? We're gonna have to heal by secondary tension, maybe even use vac vacuum assisted closure with uh, negative pressure dressing, okay? Or is this you know, a simple laceration? Is it a stellate laceration? Is it gonna have multiple kind of nooks and crannies that need to be put together? Then finally, temperature. So we want to make sure that environment is nice and warm and not hypothermic in order for that wound to heal. So these are different characteristics that are important when it comes to wound healing. All right. So today we talked about the local factors in wound healing. We talked about oxygenation, why we have initially an hypoxic environment that leads to inflammation, cytokines, but then that hypoxia has to go with restoration of blood flow and that oxygen can come in and help us with angiogenesis, help us with 
cytokines, help us with collagen and fibroblast proliferation, help us with wound contraction and wound closure, okay? Then we talked about infection and inflammation. We defined colonization versus contamination versus infection, that replicating bacteria causing local host or tissue injury. We talked about ongoing inflammation. We talked about biofilms, okay? And then we went into foreign bodies and we went into finally talking about different wound characteristics. So I hope that was clear. This has been part two, local factors with wound healing. Next time we're gonna be talking about wound bed preparation. We're gonna be talking about how we can flush a wound out, how we might need to debride a wound, get some healthy granulation tissue to promote healing. So if you like this, give it a like, give it a share, subscribe to the channel, engage in the comments. I love it when you guys ask questions, I'm able to get back to you. And check out my website, citizensurgeon.com. I built a new website and I'm starting to make each one of these videos having its own page with its own show notes. So you can watch the video and then follow along in the notes, not miss a thing. As always, stay safe, study hard. I'll see you next time.